World AIDS Day is tomorrow, December 1st, and the theme is Getting to Zero. While global progress is being made, for a variety of reasons, there are some areas where the HIV AIDS epidemic is getting worse, including right here in Hampton Roads. Up next on Another View, we'll talk about HIV AIDS and its impact on two specific groups, teens and African American women. This is a frank conversation about our community and our health, and we'll take your calls at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. I'm Barbara Ham Lee, and Another View is next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Apologize to you um, from the beginning because I'm a little stuffy. I uh, forgot to take my allergy medicine this morning, but our fearless engineer, Perry Smith, came to my rescue. So I think we'll make it through the, through the show just fine. And I also want to say a really special thank you to those of you who joined us, uh, Jay Sennett and I, last night on our sister station, WHRO TV 15. We had a program last night on Motown and music, and it was part of the um, WHRO's Season of Giving fundraiser on TV 15, and Jay and I um, exceeded our goal. We brought in close to $7,000 last night, so thank you, Hampton Roads. Thank you so much for supporting WHRO, public media, and specifically WHRO TV 15, and uh, so I know I have some TV list watchers and some radio listeners, so we appreciate all that you do for us. We're going to talk about something kind of serious today here on Another View. Um, We're talking about HIV and AIDS and the African-American community. Now, tomorrow is World AIDS Day 2012. The theme is getting to zero. That's what they want to, we want to do, get to zero in terms of infection. So listen to these stats for Virginia. One in 380 Virginians is known to be living with HIV AIDS. African-Americans are nine times more likely to be living with HIV AIDS than whites. African-American women make up 77% of all women living with HIV AIDS. For every five Virginians living with HIV AIDS, approximately four are men, three are African-American, three live in northern or eastern Virginia, that's Hampton Roads, Two are men who have sex with men, and two are ages 20 to 34 at diagnosis. Each year, one in 2,100 black Virginians is diagnosed with HIV AIDS versus one in 19,000 white Virginians. So clearly, there's work to be done in teaching prevention and providing treatment for this epidemic. Our guests today are in the trenches doing just that. Please welcome Dr. John Chittick, Executive Director of Teen AIDS Peer Corps. Hi, John. Thank How you. are Hi. you? Thank you, Barbara. So glad to have you here. And Rosalind Johnson, STD Program Supervisor with the Virginia Department of Health. Hi, Rosalind. Hi, Barbara. So glad to have you all here. These are serious serious numbers. John, I'm going to ask you to pull your mic up just a little bit so we can make sure we hear you. There you go. Um, In Hampton Roads, it's it's an epicenter of problems in terms of HIV AIDS. Rosalind, I want to ask you first to tell us, what's the difference between being HIV positive and actually having AIDS? Well, first of all, Barbara, HIV is a is the virus that's that's really causing people to get infected with HIV, and it's a progression of the disease. So the first part of the disease is someone gets infected with the virus and they have HIV, but as they progress through the g- disease, they may have other opportunistic infections. So they may end up with thrush. They may have dramatic weight loss. So that will put them in the category of AIDS. But with all of the antiretroviral treatment that we have available, doesn't mean they will stay in the AIDS category. So people kind of fluctuate between the two. But I think as a, as a whole, 
the community need to know that there is a big difference between HIV and the progression of the disease. It's one whole disease, but it's a progression of HIV. And one of the things that we're going to talk a lot about today is testing to find out if you're actually HIV positive. And John, if you take the test and you find out you're HIV positive, that is not a death sentence. No, nowadays it isn't. However, uh, we can't minimize the fact that AIDS will stay in the body to the day they li- they die. Uh, it does not come out with uh, medicine. It can be moderated. It can be uh, alleviated to a certain degree. I just want to go back, Barbara, to one thing about the statistics. Mm-hmm. The statistics are not correct when it comes to young people because 95% of all young people have never been tested and the only way we know if somebody has HIV AIDS is if they're tested positive. Mm -hmm. So we're doing events with young people. I'm going on the streets and we're doing a big one tomorrow, which I'll tell you about, about that that, Mm -hmm. uh, deals with getting young people aware that they have to be tested now, that they can't just, you can't look at a friend and say, oh, that friend has uh, HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. When it progresses, like what uh, Rosalind. Ros- I, know, I know Rosalind. I'm sorry, Rosalind. <laughs> but Rosalind's talking about is then you can start to see certain symptoms that make it there's, uh, the, the appearance, and you can tell that somebody has uh, is living with AIDS. Well, I mean, but it, that's one of the myths, I think, that people people say all the time, Rosalind. They say, well, I, he looked so nice, or she looked like she was, you know, a decent human, human being, as I've heard people put it that way. But you cannot tell if someone is HIV positive simply by looking at them, can you? you you cannot, Barbara, and you can't base your decisions as far as your sexual activity based on appearance. You can only base that on a test. You can't base that on their test results. That's why we really need to push today that as a whole in the Eastern area and for Norfolk, you know, as a whole, we need to impress upon everyone that the only way you're going to know for sure what your HIV status is, is you have to test and you have to test periodically. You can't take one test and then wait three years later and say, well, I'm still HIV negative and you've had sexual exposure with other people. You need to test every three months is my suggestion, because maybe you took the first test but you had had some type of sexual activity in a three month time period. You may have been that window period where we can't get an accurate test result. Because it doesn't show up. The virus doesn't show up right away. It does not. So Mm -hmm. I encourage people to come back three more months. And if you do a three, six and 12 months, you got a whole baseline to go back and say, well, I know I was negative from this time period and you need to keep that going. But what you really need to do is look at HIV testing, just like you want to go and get your regular checkup. You need Mm -hmm. to do it at least on a regular basis, especially if you're in a position where you're having different partners. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to say, I can't just think about myself, but I have to save the people also that I've had sexual encounters with. It's it's just not about me anymore. And if we're going to get to that zero, the biggest way we're going to get there is through testing. Mm -hmm. And John, I know that one of the big things that you're purporting um, and and pushing for young people now is the the idea that you can actually go and get a home test um, for HIV. And you can buy these over the counter without a a doctor's prescription. The big problem is the price. And I'm very, uh, I'm not happy with the one company that has the market on this. And I'm Mm -hmm. hoping the FDA will soon approve others so there'll be competition. It's uh, $49. Now, originally, they were putting out a price of $19.95 and $29, which even then is a lot for teenagers. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about home testing, 20 minutes is for the results. Very, very quick. Mm -hmm. They can take it home and if a, a... partners wanted to do a test in front of each other, they can do it in front of each other and they would have instantaneous uh, tests, Mm -hmm. understanding there is a window period of, uh, they wouldn't know last week and the week before, but certainly give everybody a very good idea of who has HIV or not. Mm -hmm. And when they do this testing, and Rosin, is the testing available here in in the -the over-the-counter test? Testing is available at some of our local drug stores. Um, Mm -hmm. They are on the shelf Mm -hmm. and... um, it's and people to, can also come to the health department to get tested, yes? Preferably. Okay. Um, just like today, I just want to let everyone know we're providing rapid HIV testing from 8.30 until 1 o'clock today in recognition of, of, of World AIDS Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, our test is 20 minutes. You can walk in the building, sit down in a confidential setting, have counseling available to you. We explain the test to you because a lot of times people take the test, but I don't think they understand How does the test work? Mm -hmm. So we want you to understand all of it. Basically, what we do is we draw blood from you Mm -hmm. and it's just like a pregnancy test. 
in actuality. And we put one drop of blood in, put some buffer solution in it, and it runs across just like a pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. And in 20 minutes, we can tell you whether you're preliminary positive. And I want to stress, um, even with the home test, it is a preliminary test result. We really, really need people to come in and get tested. And then if you come back with a preliminary result with us on a rapid test, we then send it off and get a confirmatory test because we want to make sure that the results that we're giving is conclusive. John, if you, since you work with young people all the time, um, teenager, 16 years old, goes and buys this home test, takes the test, it comes back positive. Do you, do you really think that they will then go to find the rest of the medical help that well, they need? Uh, that's what we're doing. We're out on the streets and we're having these events to tell young people, uh, as uh, Rosalind said, if you have a test positive, you need to go get a second confirmatory test. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest problem with young people is there's a stigma. They don't, unfortunately, they don't want to go to the hospital to an AIDS clinic where they could be identified. So we do this uh, um, with entertainment so that they're having a lot of fun and, uh, and so then they can easily go in and get privately tested. But one thing I want to tell you, under the law, they're not supposed to buy a test unless they're 17 or older, right. which is another thing I'm very much against because I see no reason why a 15 or a 16-year-old who's sexually active and wants to be responsible and understand what's happening with their body doesn't have the right to go pay with their own money to go out and buy a test. So mm -hmm. we're fighting that too. And we have uh, petitions into the FDA to change that. It's a ridiculous So right rule. now the cutoff is 17. 17. Mm -hmm. uh, now the other thing is we do uh, pass out uh, business cards, these little cards to kids, telling them what numbers to call for advice if they have any concerns, both CDC and local, and then myself as a trained uh, counselor on this, mm -hmm. to make sure they understand there is help and there is advice. I deal a lot, though, with uh, homeless kids. And a lot of homeless kids, you can't, you don't know where they are, where they're sleeping, where they're located, mm -hmm. but they're certainly sexually active. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. Join our conversation. What questions do you have about HIV, about AIDS, about prevention and how we can help, particularly our young people and African-American women? Um, because this is a big issue for African-American women. And why the, the female population, Raza? Well, you have to look at, when you just read the statistics, you said that it's among African-American men. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if people are not testing before they have a sexual relationship with someone, then they're going to transfer, transfer that over to the female. My concern with that is, is that we have to get women to come out and test themselves. They have to come out and take an active role in their health care. They have to come out and say, well, let me find out what my t my HIV status is before I even think about having sexual intercourse with you. That's what we really push. When we go out and do testing events, we may have couples and the couple say, well, you go ahead and test. I don't want to. Hmm. We, ha but we have to if stop one, that. one person has it. It doesn't really help. If, it doesn't if, if help. the other person. You know, because you can't sit there and say because this man here that I'm with doesn't have HIV. That means I don't have it. That doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that. Mm -hmm. You have to take a test and find out your test results for yourself. Why are people so afraid? I'm asking that of both of you. Why are they so afraid to find out their HIV status? I think John. in the old days it was that there was no uh, medicine or anything to help, and they've heard that from people. We try to tell them there is medicine now, and the sooner you find out you are tested positive you know, and it's confirmed, that you can get on to medicine that will help you. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with young people is they don't believe in adult diseases affect them. They don't want to know. They don't want their boyfriends, girlfriends to know because that's not very attractive if the word gets out, and they're horribly ashamed ashamed of their status. So we're trying to say there is hope and not to feel like this is a death sentence mm -hmm. anymore. John, tell us about Teen Core. How uh, does that work? Okay, it's uh, actually Teenage Peer Core. Peer Core, yeah, I'm sorry. Say, yeah. No, peer that's core. right. And mm -hmm. Peer Core is the concept that young people are trained, motivated, and empowered to go out and talk to their friends. So I have a large crew here in this area 
of over a couple hundred now, and uh, they will all be there tomorrow. We're going to we're expecting four hundred people at our event at the Tech Concert, which I'll okay, mention we'll again. Just wanted to say that, mm-hmm. yeah. But um, their job is, I say to them, I don't care if you volunteer your life to this cause or if you just talk to ten friends. But the importance is you need to start getting the word out, and I'm pushing very strongly social media because social media is very easy for one young person to talk to another, uh, and that's what we're trying to push. Uh, I uh, I do deal with young people that are HIV positive, and their thing is they uh, I've asked them first if they would come on, and they're just afraid their voice would be recognized, and they didn't want to do it. I just want to throw one statistic out. Mm-hmm. Right now, 25% of all new cases are estimated to be among 12 to 19 year olds which is I just these read are the that. estimated mm-hmm. ones so this is huge and yet none of them 95% are never tested the other thing Norfolk is now number one in the state of Virginia for HIV AIDS but I'm telling the people I talk to the adults and parents your kids aren't just staying in Norfolk they're going to Virginia Beach they're going to Chesapeake they're going to Hampton Newport News uh, Portsmouth I mean kids are intermingling now and this area is very fluid with the amount of population that change over that changes over all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big problem for young people. Um, I believe that we have one of your um, peer core members on the phone. Uh, Alyssa, are you with us? Yes. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Now, you have participated in um, with uh, Dr. Chittick. Talk about what it is that you do in terms of working with other teens and talking about HIV AIDS. Well, um, one of the things we do is Um, we'll actually go out and talk to other teens about what we're doing. And, like, we just, um, like, we've gone to the skate park where, you know, a lot of people go and hang out. It's like a teen hot spot. Mm -hmm. And we give them the card. We talk to them about it. We just, I mean, if we can get our point across to at least one of them, maybe they'll tell another person, they'll tell two friends, and it'll make a big part. We also do PSAs that mm-hmm. help spread the word because young people, you know, they like going on YouTube. They're always on TV. Well, they like watching TV. And when they see these PSAs, it just, it works with them. You know, uh, uh, how do you start the conversation, Alyssa? I mean, I, you know, you're a stranger. You, you're hanging out at the skate park. How do you start that conversation? Well, I'll just walk up. I'll say, hey, my name's Alyssa, you know, have a nice conversation, you know, about skating because I skate myself. Okay. And I'll just bring it up. I'll be like, so do you ever talk to any of your friends or anyone about AIDS? And, you know, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. No, Everyone knows that's there, but no one wants to talk about it. But once you start talking, they actually open up a lot more. And, and what do they tell you? Um, they'll tell us that they don't really hear anything about it. You know, it might be talked about once during school, during a health class, but no one ever wants to talk about it. And to hear it coming from another team, like me, to hear the information coming through, it actually does stick because they feel like, you know, like we're connected. Mm-hmm. And so what specific information do you tell them about it? I tell them that anyone can get it. It's not just you know, I'm not going to get it. Not me. Maybe someone else. It's not going to be me. That's not true. You're at, you are at risk as much as anyone else is. Mm-hmm. And the statistics are so high. AIDS is such a horrible disease. Like, so many people can get it. It's deadly. And no one ever wants to talk about it. Like, you can have it and you won't even know. Mm-hmm. So why do you think teens don't talk about it? I feel like teens don't talk about it because it's one of those, like, horrible issues. Like, no one wants to talk about something sad or something bad. We just want to talk about what's on TV, who we're hanging out with. We don't really want to talk about the bad stuff, but we really do need to talk about it. Very important. So besides the PSAs, do you think that perhaps um, some of the shows that are geared towards teens should address the issue as a topic? Absolutely. Um, you know, what other ways do you think that, that you could get the message out? Um, I don't know. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr. 
you know, mm-hmm. maybe if a teen posts something about it, their friends will see it. And since it's coming from their friend, it won't feel as weird talking about it. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been been um, approached a teen and they said, I'm not dealing with this. Don't talk to me. Go away. Actually, it's happened a few times. Like, I'll bring it up or they'll laugh it off. Or they'll be like, let's not. I don't want to talk about that. And, so, and what do you do then? I look at them and I'm like, this isn't something you can just brush off. Let's just talk about it a little bit. I mean, mm-hmm. you need to know about it. It's not something you can just ignore. Ignoring it won't keep you safe. Well, Alyssa, it sounds like that you're really vet, very invested in this, and we appreciate that. Why don't you hang on the line, and if we get other teens to call in, um, maybe you can give them some advice, okay? Are you planning to attend the hop-off tomorrow? Of course. <laughs> Just for our listeners, the hop-off for teens is sponsored by Teen Aids, and it is uh, tomorrow, Saturday, December 1st, from 11 until 3. It's a part of the World AIDS Day activities, and it's put on by Teen Aids Peer Corps, um, along with some other sponsors. It's at the uh, Ted Constant Center, which is right down the street from here at the WHRO, uh, 43rd Street in Norfolk, and there is a small fee, um, but there is free parking and there are going to be all kinds of activities. There will be um, step shows from the the uh, sororities and fraternities and the colleges in the area, um, dance demonstrations, and free HIV oral testing. So there will be an opportunity for teens to get tested. So parents, if you're out there listening, this is an opportunity for your teen to go to a safe place, have fun, and also get test it, which is so very important, John. Yeah, and the testing is going to be private, as Rosalind mentioned. That's absolutely essential. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will be uh, off of one of the main rooms. Uh, they w- they're, they're partitioned, uh, so nobody knows they're actually getting tested. We have trained counselors that will then work with them uh, during the 20 minutes waiting for the results. And if, God forbid, uh, somebody comes up positive, the first thing they'll do, they'll come to me, I'll talk to them. We'll arrange to get them to another place to get uh, tested by blood because this one we're doing is the oral swab or the saliva testing, Mm -hmm. uh, which for some young people, they feel it's a little less... Invasive than, uh, yeah, than the, getting yeah, up, yeah. giving up blood. Yeah, yeah. but um, the thing is, we have a tremendous amount of uh, dance groups. Everybody's been uh, volunteering because, again, we're all uh, we're all volunteers at Teen Aids, mm-hmm. and uh, we have uh, dance instructions uh, off in the other breakout rooms. We have uh, information sessions, so we have theater, and it's just a lot of singers. So it'll be a lot of fun. One thing I would like to say is Mayor Frame is coming to deliver his proclamation uh, tomorrow. He's mm-hmm. recognizing that Norfolk is an epicenter, and we have to do something. And State Senator Ralph Northam will stop by, and uh, ex Seahawks footballer uh, Kenny Easley will be there too to g- give some inspiration to the kids. Fantastic! So it sounds like a, a good time mm-hmm. and a safe time, um, and an important time yes. for for young people to get tested. And when we're talking about young people, I want our audience to understand we're not just talking about high schoolers. We're talking about college kids. That's the age mm-hmm. range from that thirteen to twenty four age range where um, this is very, very important. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Demetrius joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Demetrius. You're on the air. Hey, hey how are you doing? Okay, how yes, are I you? I just have a uh, question for the, the, I'm not sure how to refer to them, but the people that are talking today. Uh-huh. I was wondering, have they ever heard of the information uh, that, that states that the test, the actual test that they do for HIV, like the ELISA test, are actually not testing people for HIV, and they're completely inaccurate. For example, uh, the tester in itself says that there has never been a test that can actually test you for HIV, and it's not standardized. For example, you can be tested in one place and be positive, and then go to another place, like uh, another country that uses a different test, and be negative. For it. And also, the drugs such as Zyduvidine or AZT, which one of the, was one of the first drugs approved by the FDA, which was originally a cancer drug, is actually detrimental to your immune system. It actually destroys your ability to make red and white blood cells, which actually causes AIDS and its defining symptoms. There's a group called the, uh, the Group for the Scientific Reappraisal of the HIV-AIDS Hypothesis, who've uh, actually asserted all the conflicting evidence, you know, surrounding the HIV-AIDS hypothesis, and they're trying to get information out. 
And if you go on YouTube, you can watch videos. There's one video called A Toke uh, that uh, talks about a lot of the information that's conflicting surrounding the AIDS. Okay, Demetrius, and- let's let um, Dr. Chittick um, respond yes. to um, to your question. Thank you so much for calling, John. And thank you, Demetrius, for calling because I'm glad you brought this up. There is misinformation out there now. What you were talking about was absolutely true 15 years ago when there was still an awful lot of confusion about which tests were going to be used. Uh, Different countries use different tests. But uh, that's the reason we say to people, if you do get an HIV positive test, go and get a confirmatory test to be sure. And if you're still not sure, fine, go back and get a third one. But to go around and tell people that these tests uh, don't work doesn't help the situation. We need to let people know that they can get this information. And I appreciate what you said, Demetrius, but that's really old information. You want to respond also, Rosalyn? You know, the the best thing I can say, I can understand there is concern because anybody wants to make sure that the test result they get is accurate. Mm -hmm. But like John is saying, if you go one place and you feel like that test is not accurate, uh, we have patients that come in all the time and say, well, I went to this facility. I want to get retested. Of course, we're going to retest them. But we also tell them we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to do an EIA, which is an enzyme immunoassay test, which is a first part, which is looking for the antibodies in your body. As he said, it's not looking for HIV, and he's correct. It's looking for the antibodies. It's trying to see why is there an increase of antibodies in your in your body. Mm-hmm. And then what we do is we send out for the Western blot, which is a confirmatory test. And if at any point someone is still skeptical, they can always go to an infectious disease doctor and ask for a PCR, which is a viral load test, to say. So there are several different stages of testing. They can do several can testing, do. but we don't want to. We don't want to put people in a position not to test to think that it's not accurate. Okay, if you're just joining us, we're talking about HIV AIDS and the effect on teens and African American women in particular with Dr. John Chittick, Executive Director of Teenage Peer Corps and Rosalind Johnson, STD Program Supervisor with the Virginia Department of Health. There are so many myths. Can I just say one thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, A a good number, in fact, uh, a majority of our volunteers are African-American women, mostly uh, in college at NSU, ODU, Mm -hmm. Hampton, uh, even uh, Virginia Virginia Wesleyan and TCC, Mm -hmm. uh, because they do know. They are hearing now that they are uh, the fastest growing uh, group at risk and they are the most committed uh, to really get out there. And uh, well, I was going to get ready to ask, tell me some of the myths that they tell you that particularly that they heard within the African-American community about HIV AIDS and 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 that were that were proven to be false about this disease and how they've been able to move past that. Well, I would say the biggest one is denying that it's even true, like our previous caller was sort of suggesting. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who don't want to see, hear, or talk about AIDS, the three monkey syndrome, so they deny it. We now know it's true. People are getting sick. People are dying uh, of AIDS. Uh, So that's the biggest thing. Uh, There are also people that feel like, well, it's a plot against uh, African Americans. Uh, You know, it came from some laboratory. That's an old one, but that's absolutely not true. And then I always say to people, even if there are stories that you hear, we're talking about the present. We're talking about what's going on right now and what you need to do. Maybe Rosalind would like to add something to this. The biggest mm-hmm. thing is, it's Barbara, we have to get people to understand that you have to think about what's being said. When you look back, like John was saying years ago, they had the Philadelphia movie yeah, and it was okay. showing how people, you can see HIV. We talked about this earlier. You can't see that. You can't look at a person and find out that they're HIV positive. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that we also have to look at is the biggest thing we're running into is that people feel like um, there's just still this stigma there. When you think about the end game that y'all had um, on, I think it was back in August, mm-hmm. the young lady said that her parents basically were saying, don't tell nobody. Yeah, you know, be, we have, Keeping it quiet, we don't We have got to out. move away from that mm-hmm. because if someone else who is HIV positive can tell someone else, I've, I've, I've lived with this disease, I'm still going on with my life. It would encourage other people to get tested. It would encourage other people to see, you know what? This person is still living their life. They're still going on. I can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But this hush hush thing that we're going through where we don't, we've been taught not to tell anybody what goes in the home, keep it in the home. We've got to move away from that. If you look at the prime example is you look at Magic Johnson. He just came out 
And I think it really opened up a lot of doors for people to say, well, maybe I need to get tested. Mm -hmm. But we've got to get away from not telling anyone. And I believe it's the the, uh, Virginia Department of Health that has the posters up um, at at, at one that comes to mind is at MacArthur Mall. But where there there's a woman, there are two women there and and it says, you know, I'm HIV positive and I'm living my life. I mean, that's not exactly what it says, but that's the message that it's getting across. And these are real people. And I'm I'm wondering what what gives them the courage. It to takes step a lot like because that. you know we're going to protect the confidentiality of any patient that comes in our clinic. Mm-hmm. That is always a strong goal for us, and we want them to feel comfortable. But at the same point, it's really up to that patient. I think a lot of time, one patients get to the point where they feel more comfortable with their status, and they realize, okay, I have the background, I have the knowledge, I understand that I'm on medication, this is not a death sentence like it was years ago, because that is really a big myth in this day and time. You have to get beyond that and get to the point where people say, okay, I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just like me having a common cold. I'm comfortable. It's a virus. And now I'm willing to tell someone about it. If we have more people who are being more active and speaking out, it probably would help. I think people would be surprised of the number of people that are HIV positive. My biggest concern is when you look at CDC, they came out with a report saying that one out of four teens are coming back HIV positive. That should be a concern for us. Mm -hmm. And and with John's event, you know, maybe that'll reduce our number in this area by him having that event and testing and educating. Mm -hmm. But we've got to educate. We got to get people who are definitely HIV positive come out and talk so that people can see a live human being who's saying, you can still live with this. This is not a death sentence, mm-hmm. and you can go on with your life. I um, I also know that uh, Dr. Um, Tony Atwater, the president of Norfolk State University, has um, started a series of conversations on that campus about high-risk behavior and how it can affect these college students, and, and HIV AIDS is, is a part of that conversation. I mean, is is John, do you think that's one of the ways that we can continue the conversation. Yes, and I will say something that uh, I, I think everything that you're doing, Rosalind, and your group is excellent because we, that's a permanent uh, thing that's here in the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, with what Dr. Atwater is doing is great, but most schools in this area are not talking about HIV/AIDS at the very time that teenagers are now more at risk than they've ever been in the 32, 33 years of HIV/AIDS. Imagine that. The worst time now, and they're not talking about it. And when they do, it's usually a gym teacher. Not against gym teachers, but they're not qualified to be talking about HIV AIDS. And Mm -hmm. the kids don't feel comfortable talking uh, sex or asking questions about it. I'd like to point out to parents, you have nothing to fear from young people getting the medically accurate information. If, If anything can help your child to make a better informed decision, then you should be happy. Mm-hmm. Because you can do everything you want in the home, give them all the moral advice that you want with your religious leaders. But the problem is the moment they step out that door, they're entering a world where there's a lot of negative peer pressure from their friends to engage in early sex. Don't worry about condoms. I'm running into a lot of young people now who refuse to wear condoms, which mm-hmm. to me is just beyond almost imagination. Yeah. And so parents should understand that this is important to start the conversations. I'm glad Dr. Atwater uh, is doing this. I think other people have got to too. Uh, Gerald joins us, or Gerard, I can't tell. I'm sorry, from Portsmouth. Is it Gerald? Sherry. Sherry. I apologize, Sherry. Uh, no <laughs> what is your question for us? Well, uh, it was actually just addressed. I was wondering why uh, there was no conversation about uh, behavior modification using condoms uh, I and mean, understanding that it's important to get tested, but it's also important, I, I feel, to uh, have uh, young people who will not get tested to be, change their behavior. Condoms are uh, one way to do that, uh, I believe, and if there are other ways to emphasize those to them in terms of getting them to change their behavior. And I'm wondering... Is that a big part of what you're doing? Sherry, we're going to answer that question for you right now. Thank you so much for that call. Go ahead, Rosalind. Sherry, I appreciate you calling in and making that comment. Uh, Granted, our focus is on trying to get people tested, but I agree with you 100%. Uh, For the health department, um, we encourage abstinence. We encourage education more than anything. Because a lot of time, the education is not just for the person that we're talking to. 
what we explain to um, people that come to the clinic is that you're like a mouthpiece in the neighborhood for us because we're not we can't be every place at all time and when we talk to them we say what you learned today and we do a lot of behavior modification techniques in the clinic we show them how to negotiate a condom we tell them that there's more than one type of condom there's a female condom there's a male condom we go over um, the biggest thing is we provide them contracts because a lot of times uh, people that are coming to the clinic are, are not always coming in because they have an STD. Sometimes they just want to test to see that they are negative, which mm-hmm. is a good thing. So what we do is we encourage them to fill out a contract with their partner. And what it basically says is we're in an agreement and we agree that at this point we're either re- not ready to have sex and before we think about having sexual intercourse, what we'll do is go back and read our contract again. And some of the things that are in the contract is, do I want to get pregnant? Mm -hmm. Do I want to end up with an STD that I can't get rid of? Do I want HIV Uh, on top of that? Do I want hepatitis? So it gets you to really think about your behavior. And I agree with you. A lot is, 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 is behavior driven. And the only way we can help our teens and young adults is getting them to learn how to think first and think about the ramifications. And that's what we do with behavior modification. John, pe- parents a lot of times also feel, though, if we have this kind of conversation, ju- exactly what Rosden was talking about, then we're giving permission. But this is not about permission. This is about making sure that you understand that whatever your behavior is, how it is going to affect your life, possibly for the rest of your life. Right. Uh, All the studies show that that's not how teenagers uh, consider HIV conversation. They go to school and outside of class and even in class while they're texting and they are texting, the the conversation is a lot about parties, hooking up and sex. I I go to school all the time. I hear this from all my uh, teen informants. So this is a big part of school. And where do kids spend most of the day? When they're not on social media at home, then and they're doing that too. They're at mm-hmm. school talking about this. So it's already out there. Uh, we do say uh, that, yes, if you don't have sex, uh, you won't get a sexually transmitted infection. That's the medical fact. I'm not talking morally because I believe it's up to the parents and the religious leaders to talk about the moral values. But we also say that you can postpone sex until later, that you don't have to start right away because there's peer pressure to do it. Mm -hmm. I had a a young uh, African-American boy in Massachusetts who I worked with, 15 years old, and because he was a virgin and had not had sex, his friends were all calling him gay. So what happened was he was so ashamed of that stigma that he hooked up with some girl, a girl that they found him for, and he wound up getting hepatitis and gonorrhea, which could have just easily have been, have been HIV. HIV. Mm-hmm. So I'm against any type of stigma, and I do hope that kids will postpone and think twice about sex, have one partner if they have it, but um, a lot of them aren't. In college now, uh, by freshman year, uh, young people report they've already had five sexual partners up to that period of time. Some of those are one-night stands, and those are the most dangerous because there is no conversation about condoms. And and the other thing is there is a stigma also within the African-American community, particularly among males, about condom usage, correct? Yes. And and not wanting to use condoms. Yeah. Um, uh, I will have, we'll be explaining that tomorrow too, but uh, mm-hmm. there is out there right now, if, uh, if there's any young people listening or any parents that really care about this issue, polyurethane made condoms made of polyurethane are the strongest the thinnest and conduct the heat the best i'd say this even for adults uh, latex condoms are good but you have to be careful what type of lubricants you use because some oil-based lubricants will destroy the latex and definitely stay away from anything that's lambskin uh, mm-hmm. which was the big standard during the 50s and 60s so there's a lot to learn what's the biggest Mess thing though that a parent can do in terms of working with their young people to um, to be educated about HIV. Okay. I would say try to minimize the direct the directives, but suggest ask questions like a psychologist does. And anyway, if you go in for a session, <laughs> say what are you hearing? What are your friends saying? Don't say are you do- having sex, but say are your friends? What are you hearing from your friends? Uh, uh, are you talking to them about it? Uh, do they have information? Could could we help get information for you, son or daughter? Uh, would you like me to go on? I'll go on Google with you, and we'll see if we can get some information. We'll call. Uh, the Department of Health. We'll call teen aides. We'll call some of these groups and see if we can get you some information. Young people will respond to parents if 
they don't feel they're being put on the spot and they're being Mm cross-examined. I know that's the reaction of a lot of parents. I want to get right to the nitty-gritty. But honestly, if they're more patient, you'll find they'll, you'll set up a much better relationship with the child to talk to you about what's going on. And Alyssa, I know that you're still with us on, on the line. You're one of the um, Peer Corps members. Um, what do you want adults to say to you about HIV? Well, if you go to talk to a teen about HIV and AIDS and sex, like Dr. John said, you don't straight up say, are you having sex? Because the child will just not respond. They'll shut down. Start out with, so what do you hear? How how do you think? Like, what do you think about this? How do you feel about this? Get their perspective first and mm-hmm. work your way up to, well, are you comfortable talking about this with me? You know, what do you think? Do you, um, how, like, are you having sex? Like, work your way up. Don't immediately, you know, hit them with something heavy. Alyssa, where, where, how old are you? Can I ask that? I'm 16. I turn 17 soon. Okay, you turn 17. So in your, in your age group, um, where's the first place people are turning to find information? Are you talking to amongst yourselves or are you really going out to look for um, scientific or medical information to find out what's what's happening in terms of not only HIV but other STDs? Well, mostly we'll talk like to it we'll talk about it to each other, but it's not a serious conversation. Cuz you know how teens are, we'll joke around about it, but if anything, if someone really does want to look it up, we'll just go on Google and click the first thing we see. We don't actually try to go get in-depth information about this. Mm-hmm. And you also don't go to an adult to ask them? Of course not. <laughs> she says, of course not. <laughs> and and it, talk a little bit more about that. Is that because you you don't want them to think that you're engaging in, in a sexual activity or you just don't think they know? I feel like teens feel uncomfortable talking about adults because we don't want them to see us as something negative. They don't we don't want them thinking that we're going out having sex, that we're dirty or anything like that and we're scared of how they're going to respond because we just we don't know how they're going to react about this. Mhm. So we'd rather just not say anything. So what made you get involved with Peer Core? Well, Doctor John told me about someone that he knew that was close to him that got that had HIV AIDS. And it was just such a heart-wrenching story, and he put everything he had into helping her, into helping other people, and I just, I saw that in him, and I just wanted to help. I don't want people to feel like they can't talk to anyone, that they're alone, that they're helpless, because they're not. There's other people like you out there, and we're willing to help if you just let us. Alyssa, you are quite a young lady. Absolutely. That's Alyssa Jasinski, and she's a student at Princess Anne and part of the Teenage Peer Corps. And you will be at the hop off tomorrow. Anything you want to say to young folks to get them to come out? Um, Come out. It's going to be tons of fun. There's going to be a bunch of people there. We're all going to be having fun, listening to music, and you can get tested, and no one has to know. It's completely private and you get to find, you get to know whether you're HIV positive or negative, and beyond that, it's your choice. And if you do turn out HIV positive, or you just want someone to talk to about this, then there's plenty of people there that'll listen. Me included, me, Dr. John, anyone out there, we're willing to help and we're willing to listen. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us on Another View today. We really appreciate it. And I have a Facebook question, and someone wants to know whether or not you can get HIV from kissing. No, you cannot. Uh, there's, uh, and I will even tell you this, and I don't, it's not something I emphasize. Mm-hmm. Uh, oral sex is not the prime uh, 
culprit in all of this. It's still invasive intercourse, either uh, vaginal or anal intercourse is the uh, biggest problem. Uh, kissing, no, you don't have to worry about it. Saliva is not a good uh, conductor of HIV at all. Now, that said, if somebody went to the dentist that day and had their teeth pulled and they're bleeding and their friend was in a football game and got smashed and their French kissing, well, I'd say, gee, I wouldn't be wor- I wouldn't do that, but because there's STIs, STDs mm-hmm. to worry about. Mm-hmm. But no, you don't have to worry about kissing. Okay. Final word from you, Rosalind, in terms of what you want people to de- to know. I know testing is critically important, and you have testing going on today. If you can't get there today, when else can you come in? Um, they can come to our clinic Monday through Friday. Uh, we have all day clinic on Mondays and Thursdays, which means we're open all day long for mm-hmm. HIV and STD testing. Uh, we're closed on Fridays, but we made an exception today because of, in recognition of World AIDS Day, we want to provide the rapid HIV testing today. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we're open at 1245. Mm-hmm. So um, please come out. Please test. Um, Tell us where it is. It's 830 Southampton Avenue. It's right across from um, Center and Office General. And the biggest thing is if you like to ride the tide, you can ride the tide in, have a comfortable ride in and go right back to your car. Okay. All right. And Dr. John, I would just like to words. finish up by saying uh, please come to this hop off. Uh, uh, again, it's put together with a lot of people from around town. We receive no government or state funding at all. So it's all what people donate. Um, our website is www.teenaids.org. Dot org. And uh, we'd love to see, uh, this is mostly for uh, young people. We're not really requesting too many adults to come, uh, but it's going to be uh, very and ages good. 13 through? Uh, well, or what ages I know, do you say? Do you, I, we basically you go 13 through 23. We do not encourage okay. people under 13, not because they don't need the information. I have a different type of information I give out that's more age appropriate to them. Okay. That's tomorrow at the uh, ODU Ted Constance Center on 44th. 43rd Street in Norfolk from 11 until 3. Right near the corner of Hampton Boulevard. Absolutely. Yep. It's a part of World AIDS Day. Thank you so much, Dr. John Chittick. And thank you for giving both of us the opportunity to talk about this because there is somebody out there that's going to hear this and they're going to either change their behavior or they're going to think about it. Absolutely. So thank you, and that is the key. You're welcome. Yep. And Rosalind, um, um, <laughs> I just lost your last name, Rosalind. That's terrible. Johnson with the Virginia Department of Health. Thank you so much for being with me, and we'll be right back. It's no secret that some of the most elite athletes come from right here in Hampton Roads. One of them is Portsmouth native LaShawn Merritt. Heading into the 2012 Olympic Games, Merritt was ranked number one in the world in the 400 meter, but a pulled hamstring kept him from competing. Now he's all healed and training for the 2016 Games. And as our Lisa Godley found out, he's also spending much of this time off the track, making a difference in the lives of others. But it's LaShawn Merritt who's putting on the pressure as they come into the final straight. And he streaks ahead LaShawn Merritt of the USA to cross well in front of the rest of the pack. Some may know LaShawn Merritt as the Portsmouth sensation who won gold at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. But this fierce competitor's road to the top of the platform began back in elementary school. Uh, I started sports at a young age, at six. I started with uh, baseball, football, and basketball, but I was a standout in all of them because of my speed. You know, I had that athletic ability in all of them, but my speed really stood out. It wasn't until high school that LaShawn realized he was truly a special runner. It was at that time that he discovered his race. My junior year in high school, my track coach told me, real men run the 400. You know, I was just kind of running around. I was doing the, the sprints, and nobody wanted to do this certain event because it's the worst event on the track, supposedly. I did it, and from that first one, I fell in love. LaShawn knew that his speed on the track was only half of what he needed to succeed. Having a mother who works in the school system, he was very well aware of the role that education would play in his success. In school, it's a lot of things you may learn that you're not even going to use, you know, but the whole point of it is just stressing and, and working your brain. 
it was fortunate for me that I went into a career that I am in now that it, they didn't really ask for a diploma, you know, but I had to have it, you know, it's, it's, it's conducting interviews, it's standing in front of corporate people, knowing to, to how to write, how to read, you know, that's, that's just high school. You haven't even taken it to college yet, but um, it's very important. Sean also shared with another view how he ended up going into area schools and talking to the students. This whole year I was training in Florida, so I was back and forth here. But when I got here, it, I just noticed driving around and going to stores just the uh, imbalance in this generation. I called my, my PR and told them, look, can you set up, uh, call some different schools and just tell them I'm coming in? And I went in and, and just wanted to be a motivation and I didn't, wasn't really a speech. Every crowd got something different. It was just what was going on in the room, just from the heart, straight from somebody who sat in the same class in the same gym that you sat in and just giving you what I've been through. His advice to young athletes eager to wear his track shoes? And whatever you want to do as far as sports, do it. Believe that you can get it done. It starts with, with self-belief. You know, if you believe it, you, you draw in people who believe you can get it done as well. And the people who don't think you can get it done, they don't need to be a part of your team. You know, so first believe in yourself and know that hard work pays off. So my whole deal is work hard and let my hard work be my confidence when I line up. I don't want to train. I hate training. You know, it hurts. It's, it's literally times in training where I can't stand up and take four consecutive steps because I've built so much like to gas it up. But you know, it's, it's times when I line up, I think about, look, I done did this, that, this, and that, and that's my confidence. So now it's, it's just show up and show out time. Opens a big lead for Sean I'm Lisa Gabo. Wow, what an incredible story from an incredible young athlete. Time now for things to view and do in Hampton Roads. You will be my Saturday love. Congressman Bobby Scott's staff will hold satellite office hours to assist constituents living in Surrey and Charles City, Virginia. Tuesday, December 11th, they will be at the Surrey County Community Center on Enos Farm Road in Surrey. And on Wednesday, December 12th, the staff will be at the County Administration Building in Charles City. Satellite hours are from 2 until 4 on both days. Call 757-380-1000 for details. Come sell Celebrate the holidays at the Attics Theater with the presentation of The Attics Nutcracker, the timeless classic brought to you in a fresh, bold new way. Come enjoy the swinging sounds of jazz, gospel, pop, and traditional African drumming Friday, December 7th and Saturday, December 8th. Both performances are at 8 p.m. Tickets are available. Visit CACC inc.org for more information. The Hurrah Players are holding auditions for its upcoming production Freedom Train. They are seeking males and females ages 5 and up. The audition is Tuesday December 18th. Call 627-5437 to schedule an appointment. The Department of Energy is looking for students or recent college graduates to participate in the DOE Scholars Program. The internship is 10 weeks from May until August of 2013. Undergraduate graduate and postgraduate students of an accredited institution of higher learning are encouraged to apply. Deadline for applications is July 4th, 2013. Visit orise.orau.gov slash scholars to apply. And finally, we'd like to send a huge congratulations to Executive Director Gail Easley and her staff and the students who participate in the RISE program at the Attics Theater. The program received the 2012 National Arts and Humanities Youth Award, which was presented to RISE participant Tiffany Pygram or from First Lady Michelle Obama. RISE stands for Rhythm in Setting Expectations, a program at the Crispus Attics Cultural Center that develops learning and life skills in young people. Congratulations again to the RISE program. We share critical information on today's program that young people need to hear, so we encourage you to go to anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Lencia Smith, who answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a wonderful weekend and let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.